<coughs> Good morning. The, um, we had uh, started our uh, discussion of um, cold strip mills, and um, we had arrived, um, I think, s discussion, remember, the um, introduce the concept of pup coil um, that you get when you have uh, reversing mills. That's always the problem or the fact that you have this loss of material um, with, well, it's not loss of material, but the material has off gauge thickness uh, at, um, at either end as when you do a uh, uh, user reversing mill. Um, there are, of course, uh, any numbers of uh, uh, possibilities to um, to carry out um, or to increase the the, the productivity of um, uh, reversing mills. And uh, this is, uh, for instance, one existing option here, where we have two stands, hmm? uh, two tension reels. Yes, and of course, uh, instead of give, giving one pass, uh, uh, one reduction every time you, you, you cross the mill, you, you give two. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, obviously it goes uh, faster and you have a higher productivity, but that's what you would expect if you have mill, uh, more mill stands. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there are... Uh, uh, the, the reason why I mention this is because there are some uh, special two-stand mills which are uh, specific to certain uh, products. And in particular, a tin plate. Uh, tin plate is uh, uh, another word for steel, so it is used for, for packaging applications mm, bec because they're very often uh, uh, coated uh, with that uh, tin coating. So, uh, and you have a double cold reduction mill. Hmm? Uh, and what you basically have is, is two stands, yes? Um, <coughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, they, they don't do the same thing. The first um, uh, uh, stand is, is used for reduction, is an actual reduction. And the second stand is a surface conditioning stand. So that's where you, you apply specific surface roughness on your, your, your strip. Hmm? All right, and uh, so this is an example here, the same thing. I've actually never seen one um, uh, in working, I have to admit. The only one I ever saw and took a picture of uh, at that time um, had, its, had this work rolls uh, removed, so um, I couldn't see it in operation. But uh, so, so that's a, a special type of two-stand mill um, where you, you don't you only do one reduction. So obviously, um, the the reduction that that you apply is is not very large, and is of the order of a um, uh, couple of percents at best. Okay. Um, we'll um, talk at length about automatic gauge control. Uh, when we uh, when we talk about the, the the thickness control of strip in general um, and the profile that's the thick the thickness of the strip in the width direction, um, but um, so when you have a, a tandem mill, yes, you have a tandem mill. Uh, if you want to have a stable operation, yes, um, you have to have a constant mass flow through the, uh, the, the line, yes? And so uh, basically what, what goes in must, must go out. Hmm? So the uh, velocity times thickness uh, product of the strip that goes in must be equal to the velocity and strip thickness that goes out. It's basically mass uh, balance. Hmm? And that's called uh, constant mass flow and constant mass flow control is very important uh, in uh, the control of the um, stability of your, um, your uh, uh, mill. Hmm? 
So uh, mass flow, volume flow uh, out of each dance product of the gauge time strip. Hmm? Um, if, however, there is an error in uh, stand one, hmm, this will have an impact on all, uh, on all the other stands. Hmm? And so it's very important that um, you, you have uh, stability. Hmm? Like this one can be stable, but in other, uh, uh, there is, for instance, an exit uh, uh, gauge error. Uh, you can correct this by, by changing the exit speed. So um, you can uh, do gauge control by uh, speed control. And uh, as I said, I, I don't want to talk about this too much today, but um, uh, because we'll, we'll have a separate uh, lecture on that um, in, um, later on in the course. But uh, uh, what is important is that, so the, um, you see what is very important in this uh, thing here, in this stability, is, is the thickness, obviously. Um, through as it varies through the through the line, hmm? so uh, the thickness of the uh, uh, or the or rather the the opening of the roll uh, byte yes uh, is done by actuators and uh, unsurprisingly in the cold rolling mill you get the same type of actuators as you, we've seen in the hot strip uh, mill you have. Uh, screw down uh, controllers and hydraulic uh, controllers. Hmm? Uh, the, the screw downs, as we know, have a slow response. Hydraulic systems have a much faster response. Um, the uh, other problem is that there may, there may be some backlash uh, in the control and, of course, mechanical wear. Hmm? The speeds you can see what is important is the speed of the displacements are one millimeters per second at maximum four millimeters per second in the hydraulic capsule so it's much faster uh, uh, speed and also the acceleration of you know, the change the rate of change of the uh, the speed is is also uh, uh, impressive in the case of the hydraulic control so you can react very much more quickly to mill instabilities or, or changes that are required in with a hydraulic uh, actuators. Hmm? Uh, there, there are also problems here. Of course, you have to make sure that uh, there's no contamination of the oil. You have to maintain the seals, etc. Hmm? And, and uh, again, as I said, you get the same type of systems with the uh, in comparison to the hot strip mill. You have uh, on top, you can have uh, your hydraulic gap control, which presses down on the, uh, uh, the back up roll chuck. And, uh, or you can have a electromechanical screw down, and there you have a motor, a gear, and then a position control that works, uh, that's based on a, a screw, a screw and nut system. So that's much uh, slower. Um, in addition to these systems that basically control the thickness, there are also systems that will do things to the um, um, mill to control the profile, yes, the, the thickness profile. Um, and again, um, we'll have a separate uh, lecture on that, but. Uh, just as an introduction, and you don't have this slide in your package, um, you have, for instance, systems where in between the backup roll, backup roll and work rolls, work roll is here, yeah, you have intermediate rolls. Yes, there, this one here and this one here, and you, you can see they have a special shape. Um, uh, and so this is a six mile, uh, six high, uh, stand, yes, and uh, you shift these lateral rolls and that allows you to control the profile of the strip, so how the thickness changes in the transverse direction. 
Okay, that's also important as I've uh, al already told you. So this is one of the systems <coughs> that are um, used for profile control. Other systems, uh, modern system, will uh, you, uh, use uh, cross pairing of the roles. So the, the roles are slightly crossed, yes, to control the, uh, the, the strip profile, okay? Um, there are, um, in addition to the stand and the rolls, uh, just like you have in the hot strip mill, there are a lot of measuring devices in the um, in a hot in a cold strip mill. Yes, you will measure thickness, obviously. Yes, tension, force, the gap, the speed of the strip. You can. It's also much more easy easier to do this in a cold strip mill because the temperatures are much lower, yes? Um, and, um, and there is no oxidation, etc. cetera. So um, you can measure the thickness with X-ray gauges, yes? Isotope gauges or contact gauges. The uh, isotope and the X-ray gauge, you're basically measuring the absorption of this, of this radiation, yes? And that allows you to um, uh, measure the, the thickness. In the case of contact gauge, you actually uh, have a, um, a gauge that, that monitors the thick measures the thickness right directly. Hmm? Um, that's only, that's, you won't see this very often you, you, um, because it's, um, it's not very stable at high rolling speeds. You have tension controllers in this case, because the strip moves much faster, very fast, uh, you, you really cannot have a tension control. Remember that the tension control is, you had the tension control with loopers in a hot strip mill to um, compensate for differences in strip velocities, yes? Um, so in this case, um, it's done you actually measure the, the strip tension and you have special uh, tension meter rolls to do this. Um, and of course you measure the load, set, load uh, uh, that you apply uh, and if you have um, uh, 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 hydraulic uh, gauge control system, you have hydraulic pressure transducer and you, you also measure the velocity. We'll, um, again, uh, this will all be the subject of um, a more um, detailed discussion as, as we talk about a strip profile uh, in particular. Let's have a look at what, uh, what we typically get when we roll a, uh, when we look at a, a hot, a cold strip mill, excuse me. Uh, so what are typical parameter values, for instance, for the amount of reduction that you're giving to a material. Obviously, um, again, as you, the material that comes out of the pickling line typically have six millimeter thickness. And obviously, if you're making a product that's 1.2 millimeter thick or a product that's 0.8 millimeter thick, the reduction will be, will be different. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you see here that um, uh, so three millimeter products you only reduce 50 percent, 1.5 millimeter, uh, 55 to 60 percent, 0.8. The reductions start to increase. Yes, and and they can be even higher. We like to give, in, for certain products, we like to give uh, uh, a lot of deformation because deformation impacts texture and texture impacts formability after recrystallization, yes? That's one thing. The other thing is we like to give enough deformation because if the deformation, the amount of deformation you give is not very high, the recrystallization will be very sluggish. Hmm? So for instance, um, giving less than 50% of deformation usually results in very slow a recrystallization kinetics. Hmm? So, uh, wh why is that? Well, you know that the driving force for recrystallization is the dislocation density. 
So if you don't have a very high, in, or not high enough dislocation density, your driving force will be relatively low and, and your uh, recrystallization will be sluggish. That's the, the reason. Uh, two examples of tandem melts here. Um, the number of stands, again, depends on um, your product portfolio and depends on your, uh, your investment capabilities, things like that. So, uh, but it, uh, typical, you know, you get five to six, I would say, um, uh, uh, mills in your tandem mill. Um, but this is an example here where you had uh, four to five. Uh, you, d you don't always have to use all of them, but the width uh, typically 600 to uh, 1.8 meters, 600 uh, millimeters to 1.8 meters. Thickness ranges, you can see um, in uh, um, two to six millimeters, hmm? one and a half to five millimeters. That is typical, uh, the, the type of material that, that you can roll. Yeah? So you cannot roll uh, stuff that's uh, 12 millimeters thick, typically, unless you have a special uh, equipment. And then the, the thickness out is typically um, from a half a millimeter to, uh, you know, two, three millimeters. Yeah? Now, it is p for certain products, hmm, you want to have very thin gauges hmm, uh, because thick gauges are not required. I, for, uh, what, what would be an example? For instance, if you're making uh, sheet material uh, to make boards, right? You don't really need thickness. You just want to have a, a nice uh, met metallic surface, basically. So, or you have packaging materials, right? You want to have thin material. Hmm? So in that case, the, um, the cold rolling can, can be very, very, uh, the, the cold rolling thickness can be very much uh, smaller. Hmm? Reductions, maximum reductions are of the order of 80 to 90 percent, hmm? mostly. Hmm? And, and these are some values for the, the strip tension. You always have strip tension um, to uh, control rolling forces. Hmm? The, um, what happens in the roll gap, it's pretty much, in terms of uh, the process, uh, pretty much the same as what happens in the roll gap in a hot strip mill. Hmm? You have um, frictional forces that work on the strip. You have a neutral point, frictionless force forward until the uh, uh, neutral point, frictional forces going backwards uh, on the exit part past the uh, neutral point. And uh, you get roll flattening. Hmm? So if your radius, your work roll radius is, has an apparent radius of 280, the actual contact radius may be double that amount, yes? And usually you get a few percents of forward slip. Hmm? You also typical values here, this would be for a, one of the stands in a cold rolling mill, uh, goes in at 26 kilometers an hour goes out at uh, 30 kilometers an hour, yes, and, and increasing, yes. And, and this kind of looks, uh, uh, it's a little bit, I'm not sure if it's perfectly in uh, proportion, but it's very close to the actual proportion. So that's, um, you know, what, what the rolling actually looks like. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Same rules hold as the ones we saw with the hot strip mill, yes? Friction is very important, yes? A reduction of friction gives you a very high reduction in rolling force, yes? The, the, uh, and, and the other parameters are, are we already discussed, but I want to concentrate on the effect of friction. In the, the hot strip mill, I already told you, it's really difficult to do um, very uh, controlled friction control because, uh, because of the high temperatures, yes, the very harsh conditions. Hmm? It's being done, uh, but you, you're usually in a situation of high friction. In the case of the, uh, the cold rolling mill, it's a very different situation. You can actually uh, uh, do very well controlled 
uh, frictional, uh, um, low friction uh, rolling. Hmm? Okay, and so this is a good moment to talk about this this lubrication. Hmm? So the uh, the lubricants in uh, uh, the cold uh, strip mail, of course, will first role is to reduce the friction, hmm? and and we know it has a direct impact on rolling forces and it gives you high your quality strip surface hmm? uh, better control of strip uh, surface the strip profile and uh, work roll wear hmm? the additional uh, thing that you get is cooling effect hmm? cooling effect you have uh, a reduction of the heating of the work roll where does this heating come from well remember the that when you deform a material uh, uh, plastically, 90% of the energy uh, is actually turned into heat. Yes. So, and, and of course, you have the, the frictional uh, uh, force, uh, the frictional aspects that give you also heating. Mm? So you could use uh, water to cool. Mm? Why not? But water is a poor lubricant, so we we don't use water to. Uh, to lubricate. Hmm? So what do we use? Uh, we can use, uh, as, as lubricants, we can use emulsions, uh, dispersions, or what's called uh, stabilized dispersion. Hmm? So what is an emulsion? It contains um, one and a half to five percent of a product that's called a surfactant, yes? And the surfactant limits oil breaking into separate layers hmm? Hmm? and without the need for agitation so, so you know that when you're mixing water and oil they they don't mix very much yes and uh, so if you uh, don't agitate this they will eventually form a um, separate water layer and oil layer right adding a surfactant stabilizes the this o this oil in uh, mixture in water hmm? Dispersion, hmm? okay, and in the dispersion, we get a little bit more uh, uh, technical here, it, where here you have a cationic surfactant forms this pr pr uh, protective colloidal layer on the surface of oil particles, and that's the way you eliminate coalescence. Hmm? The, uh, the particle size distribution is narrower than in the case of the emulsion. Particles meaning oil droplets that you have in the water. Hmm? And, uh, but if you, sta if you leave it standing, the oil layer will split off. So you um, usually need to redisperse um, this dispersion by mechanical agitation. Hmm? So that's a big I difference between uh, an emulsion and a dispersion. And then you have a stabilized dispersion. That's a system that's kind of in between emulsion and dispersions, which of course, have the advantages of both, yeah? um, okay? and, um, and you don't need agitation uh, to keep the uh, lubricant um, in good condition. The, the third thing that you get from the, uh, the lubricants is surface cleanliness uh, 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 issues. Uh, when you uh, use a lubricant, uh, the oil, which is carbon-based, yes, will uh, can, will give you carbon deposits, yes, and uh, so, so one of the things that uh, that you get after uh, cold rolling at the surface hmm, is um, two things: you get what are called iron fines, small metallic particles, and carbon contamination. The carbon contamination comes from the lubricant. That uh, that's breaking, that's broken down during the, the process of rolling, and the um, the iron fines are the result of um, cold welding of the asperities, the, the little mountains of the roughness that you have on the strip surface, um, and um, and and these uh, cold welds breaking that gives you these these small these small particles. So you usually have to um, clean those things off afterwards okay but let's now uh, go back to our uh, lubricants and our emulsions hmm? so if um, to make a, 
uh, a lubricant. We basically have water. We uh, mix it with oil and this emulsifier so that these particles, oil particles, are stable. Hmm? So you have water and oil emulsion is stable. It, uh, what is this, um, the structure of the oil droplets in, uh, in the water? Well, it looks like this. You have an oil droplet and in uh, the uh, emulsifier, uh, molecules orient themselves with the blue end on the side of the water and the, uh, uh, the red end here on the side of the oil. And so the, the structure is such that the one end of this uh, molecule is hydrophilic yes, and is water soluble. And the other end, the tail here, is lipo or, or uh, oil or fat uh, philic uh, and is oil soluble. So by having the oil droplet coated with these uh, molecules, you stabilize them hmm, in the water. Hmm. Now, uh, uh, emulsifiers, uh, lubricants, etc., are very, very well kept secrets from from companies. Yes. So w you know, I can't give you any uh, uh, detailed composition, uh, but. I can uh, give you some information so about the, what we say formulation. Maybe what does the thing consist of? So th there are easily 7, 15 chemical components in your, uh, in your lubricant. And the major constituents for, for those who are, uh, have a chemical backgrounds are esters and mineral oils. Those are the, the big, uh, the main constituents. Hmm? They are what we call these esters and mineral are the base lubricants which are important for the elasto-hydrodynamic lubrication. We'll see in a moment what this uh, uh, word elasto-hydrodynamic uh, lubrication means, but it's a fundamental uh, aspect of lubrication in the cold uh, rolling mill. You also have fatty acids which are important in boundary lubrication, and then you have antioxidants. Yes, the name says what they do. They prevent the lubricant from oxidizing in contact with the air or polymerizing in contact with the air. Hmm? You have the emulsifiers, obviously, hmm, to, um, to do uh, the, good, the mixing of your uh, oil uh, uh, particles. And then you have phosphorus and sulfur containing additives. Hmm? These uh, phosphorus uh, containing additives make uh, strong, they make boundary, very thin surface boundary layers yes, that are um, uh, resistant to shear. And sulfur containing additives um, prevents welding between surfaces when you have very high pressures. Hmm? Cold, yes. So um, uh, these two elements is very important if you ever do like failure analysis or problem analysis, always make sure that uh, you don't ascribe um, high sulfur content, high sulfur measurements to your steel if it is, if it may be a part of the um, formulation of your uh, lubricant, okay? Because you will you know, sometimes, certainly if you're in, st in research once in a while, you'll, ha you'll, get, you'll have to deal with um, technical problems, yes? And you get something that's cracked, yes? And then you, you quickly analyze this and you say, ah, I found it, it's just too much sulfur in the, yes? And it may not have to do anything with the problem. It's just the residue of the lubricant. Okay, so always be very careful um, when um, doing your um, analysis or coming to conclusions. So let's um, <coughs> have a look at um, the the action of lubricants and, and try to understand why th what this elasto hydrodynamic lubrication is all about. The surfaces both of your rolls and of your strip, th these are not atomically flat surfaces, right? They're very far from, 
they're technically flat surfaces. So if you would um, um, look at the surface, you, you would see, you know, um, what we call peaks and valleys in this thing, yes? Um, and um, what happens at the interface uh, would kind of uh, depend on how close these two surfaces get together, right? So, so let's look at um, a situation where uh, we bring these two surfaces together. So we increase the surface area. Mm -hmm. So as we do this, um, we get uh, more and more asperities. So that uh, the mountain peaks in the uh, surface profile start to touch each other. And if I continue increasing the, the contact area, um, these asperities will be squashed, yes? And uh, there may be even a creation of a bond, which we call cold welding, yes? So um, at the surface, we, we're talking about um, significant amount of deformation at this surface, yes? And um, we may also entrap for instance, if we had had a lubricant here, we may entrap lubricants in these uh, surrounded by these welded regions. Yeah? Okay, so if there is no um, lubricant added, we we we're talking about uh, dry lubrication or boundary lubrication, right? All right. All right. So the. Um, this, this process of two surfaces uh, moving with respect to each other now, yes, uh, will create friction, yes? So, um, so we have, very simply put, friction mechanism, very uh, simple. You can have the top one here, where you have one very hard asperity on this hard material, yes, that gouges that scratches the other surface. Hmm? Uh, where would that happen? Well, for instance, if this is a roll, uh, roll surface, yes, and this is a strip surface, yes, and you know when you're rolling, you, you have uh, you know, soft material, soft steel, and you have your very hard work roll, and there is a friction, frictional uh, displacement, uh, you could get plowing, yes? And so you would damage the surface. So that's a, a possibility. You can have <coughs> asperities touching each other, cold welding and breaking off. Mm? That's a typical uh, source of uh, iron powder, uh, iron uh, fines, as I said. Or you can have this kind of... Uh, uh, that is um, where the, the surfaces are, are now separated by a, an oil, a layer of lubricant, yes? And there, the, uh, what, what is important is the shearing of the lubricant film. Hmm? That's basically going to control the, the friction. Hmm? Right, so um, this uh, uh, shearing behavior hmm, is, um, uh, scientifically, it's in this coefficient that we call the, uh, the viscosity, coefficient of viscosity. That's the main lubricant parameter. Hmm? So, so when, when I move this top surface with the bottom surface, relative to the bottom surface, um, and they're basically floating here on, a, on this lubricant, yes? Hmm? What happens, so uh, on this side, the film is kind of, touching the top surface, and on this side, it's touching the bottom surface, right? So when I move, um, uh, I shear uh, the top two uh, surface relative to the bottom surface, I'm basically shearing, shearing the, uh, the lubricant fill, hmm? right? And the viscosity, yes, is this shear, is, is the ratio of shear stress relative to the shearing rate that I can achieve. Um, so this viscosity hmm, is, and this is very important, is a function of two things. <coughs> the, uh, 
it's a function of the temperature. So we know, uh, you, you know this from you know, uh, maybe your experience with butter, yes, is that uh, butter is, has a certain viscosity. If you heat it up a little bit, let it stand in the sun, it becomes very liquid, yes, the viscosity has gone down very much. So, um, so you're not surprised that the viscosity um, is equal to a, uh, a, 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 a constant, yeah? and then an exponential dependence of temperature. Yeah? So it's, it decreases exponentially with increasing um, the temperature. So it decreases when the temperature increases. There is also a pressure effect. And the pressure effect, you may not know this, but the pressure effect goes this, the other way. You increase the pressure, the viscosity increases. All right. Okay. So let's have um, uh, 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 some numbers here. Hmm? So you see here uh, the viscosity of a mi mineral oil. Uh, the um, viscosity is expressed in, in poise centipoise, to be more specific, yes. Uh, you see that as we increase the pressure, we get a steady increase in the viscosity, 50, 51, 10 to the tent, yes, very high. Yeah. Let's have a look at what happens with water. It pretty much remains unchanged, okay? So let's try to bring together these elements of uh, surfaces touching each other and uh, viscosity. Mm -hmm. It turns out that um, in a lubrication situation, um, there are parameters, right? Um, for instance, um, you have, of course, your, uh, your uh, our viscosity here. Yes, um, we have the pressure, hmm? and we have the the relative velocity. Yeah. Yes. You could do it quickly. You can do it slowly. You could, okay. So you, there are many parameters. So you would think, um, in a situation like this, it it would seem difficult to present uh, the uh, lubrication, the, the situation for lubrication, um, in one diagram. But it turns out it's possible. It's possible to plot for a, um, a, a frictional system like this one, hmm, where I have lubricant, yes, certain viscosity, a velocity, and a pressure, yes, I, that I can plot the friction of the, the coefficient of friction, yes, coefficient of friction, I remind you, is uh, sh shear times, uh, sorry, let's just, just call it uh, coefficient of friction at this stage. Um, if you plot this uh, versus the velocity times the, uh, the velocity times the viscosity divided by the pressure, yes, by this term, yes, you will find that it's possible to plot uh, the um, frictional coefficient as a single line. Uh, and the friction coefficient has this shape, very um, characteristic shape. Mm -hmm. the, uh, so you have This factor here, hmm, velocity times uh, viscosity divided by pressure, yeah, that's, that's the important parameter. Okay? So let's see what happens as I increase this parameter. Hmm? So how, how could I do this, for instance? Hmm? Well, for instance, let's assume I keep the pressure and the viscosity the same. Right? So that means I, I say this is constant and this is constant, yes? And I change the, the velocity. Yeah, I, go I go very slow or I go very fast. Yeah? 
And you probably did this experiment yourself once. You know, you have like um, a surface and another surface, yes? And you apply pressure. If you move them very slowly with respect to each other, you can barely move them. You can barely move them. However, if you have enough velocity, you'll, you'll feel that one of them, that the, the, um, the two surfaces seem to be separated by a, a, a liquid layer, yes? And if you move very fast, you can keep this, uh, the top surface, the top material, uh, as it were, floating on a lubricant layer, even if this is only water. You, have you ever done this experience? But if you do it very slowly, what, so what happens is if you don't move very fast and you have a certain pressure, you're squeezing out the lubricant, right? Okay, so, so low velocity, I get large friction. Right? Okay, so that, uh, that uh, part of the, and, and uh, with uh, technical lubrication uh, situation, you get the same thing. So at very low uh, speeds, or low viscosity, or very high pressure, hmm, I get dry lubrication, dry or boundary lubrication. The, the surfaces really grind over one another. The effect of the lubricant is minimal, okay? But what happens if we increase the, the speed, yes? We see this drop, yes? This drop here. So this is boundary lubrication. Is this an area where we would like to operate? Obviously not, right? Hmm? Uh, then we see a drop in the uh, coefficient of friction. And this is what we call mixed lubrication. This is the situation where you start making pockets, stable pockets of uh, lubricants within the roughness, hmm? the roughness profile of these two surfaces. And then you hit a minimum in the uh, coefficient of friction. And so there you have uh, lubricant pockets and you have what this low situation is what we call uh, elasto hydrodynamic uh, lubrication yes and that's where you want to operate uh, or have an, a, a, a um, lubricant that works in in these conditions yes if you increase the, um, uh, the speed even further, you get this floating situation that I explained, yes, where there is apparently no more very low frictions, yes, and this is called the hydrodynamic lubrication, yes, and, and, and there you have complete separation of the surfaces. Hmm? They don't even touch each other anymore. Hmm? All right. So this is hydrodynamic. And this is elasto, uh, I always hear, hydrodynamic, yeah. elasto hydrodynamic. Um, now, obviously, something happens at this interface, yes? And what happens? Well, physically, you're changing the thickness of this boundary layer when you're changing the velocity. And um, obviously, it's very small here, yes? And when you have hydrodynamic uh, conditions, you know, very low coefficient of friction, you have a, uh, a full separation of the surfaces. The, uh, you, you reach a maximum value. Hmm? And then in between, you get this, all right? And you want to be operating, yeah, I should uh, put it a little bit, a little bit too fast here. You want to operate it in this region here, yes. where you, you still have contacts, but you have these pockets of oil that um, um, keep the, uh, uh, give you low uh, friction. All right. Good. So, So when, when is 
because uh, this was just a, oh by the way uh, this is important this curve is is um, if you're ever involved in uh, in this kind of work this is called the, the Streback curve yes by the inventor or the, the guy who studied this uh, so when when how how thick are these layers typically uh, in um, boundary uh, lubrication or elasto hydrodynamic lubrication well it basically depends on the situation depends on the roughness of the surfaces which are the the roll and the strip and the lubricant film thickness okay so say we have a work roll roughness r which is uh, r w r and a strip roughness r s and a lubricant film thickness h the combined roughness of these two, we usually make this geometric mean, so square root of square of the roughness of the work roll times square of the roughness uh, uh, roughness of the uh, strip. If H, yes, is uh, uh, larger than three times this value, yeah, let's let's just do it simply. If H is equal to this value, then I have boundary uh, lubrication. And that's kind of understandable. Then you can see the, the roughnesses will touch. Between uh, one and three times the, uh, the roughness profile, we have mixed uh, lubrication. And once H is larger than three times the roughness, we get um, elastohydrodynamic um, lubrication. Um, now you may wonder um, where this um, wh where does this elastic come from? The word the, the, that's it's uh, related to the fact that in the um, roll gap, yes, you have elastic deformation of your roll material mm? and mm, so there's elastic deformation of the surfaces yes that's um, that happens at the same time and the reason we all know that you have this uh, uh, this flattening is because you have these very high pressures in the roll gap mm? so the um, the roll gap um, the uh, the pressure that the um, uh, em emulsion sees hmm, increases as you as the uh, um, the lubricant is sucked into the uh, the roll gap yes so it uh, the pressure and then the pressure increases 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 what happens to the uh, viscosity also increases a lot yes because of the very high pressures yes and then uh, you would expect that the pressure would decrease as you go out, yes, but it increases one last time, yes, before it, yeah? and this is called the Petrusevich peak. And the reason why is uh, when the strip comes out of the from the between the roll, yes it will elastically rebound. It will elastically rebound. Yes? So it, yeah? sorry. Um, the, 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 the roll will elastically rebound, right? The, it's the roll that's flattened. So, so it will go like this. I'm exaggerating, right? So you get an extra squeeze, yes? And that's what causes this pressure peak here. So, so the lubricant thickness at the entry gets uh, reduced, yes, to uh, a certain value, gets squashed at the exit. That's what gives you this pressure peak. And um, so that's the situation you basically uh, have to uh, envision. And, and this is then this uh, H, uh, the, the thickness, and that should be about three times the, the geometric mean of the roughness of the strip and, and the rolled surface. Hmm? All right. So you get this um, elasto 
hydrodynamic lubrication is you have a full lubricant fill, yes, uh, and you have elastic contact, yes, deformation of the surface, and a very high pressure. Hmm? Um, high pressure is, uh, results in this flattened contact area, and this is really important, is that you may not know this when you're uh, kind of feeling the viscosity of your lubricant, uh, but in the roll gap, the, uh, the viscosity is much higher than the viscosity that you have uh, without the pressure. Hmm? And the motion can be, um, um, where it's not touching, can be gliding motion, right? where you have some, what people uh, are, uh, call um, aquaplaning. Hmm? Um, the, uh, uh, so you remember we have a, a film that will increase in thickness as my velocity increases. You can measure this, yes? How would you measure this? Well, it's kind of difficult to measure it in a, um, uh, in a rolling mill, obviously. Yeah? You, you have a strip, you have a huge roll, and then you have a strip, and then another huge roll. It's very difficult to go and measure in the, in the roll gap what the thickness is of this uh, film. Certainly, if you see, as in here, that the, the thickness is about 100 um, nanometers. So, oops, yeah. so how do you do this? You do, you do it in the lab. Uh, using glass glass parts, uh, you, you 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 basically uh, reproduce in the lab the conditions the, of pressure and velocity. Yes, you have in the uh, mill, and then with by having glass tools, as it were, you can measure the the film thickness. And so you you can do this. Yes, and. Um, uh, so, so you have the uh, influence of the uh, velocity. So as you uh, increase the velocity, you can see that the, uh, the thickness goes from uh, 10 nanometers to over uh, a few hundred nanometers, yes? And that it changes cons constantly, yes? So, Again, uh, this is one of the reasons why um, continuous operations are so important. Because when you have a stable continuous operation yes, of a mill, you have stable velocities. This already tells you that as you change the velocity of the uh, in your mill, you will have different uh, lubrication situations. Yes, and so and that will have, as you know, an effect on the loading, the, the rolling forces, etc. Hmm? So we, the, the, uh, it's very important. The other thing, um, so the temperature increase uh, will uh, shift this. Hmm? So that means that, um, say, we have a, a certain uh, velocity here, right? The the film thickness is. At 24 degrees is this. When you increase the, uh, the temperature, you get the decrease in the film thickness, okay? So thermal stability, velocity stability is all very important in technology. And these are measurements for what we call neat oil. If you, you can use your, your lubricant oil uh, and not make an emulsion, yes? Uh, if you do that, you, you say neat oil. I mean, you don't, it's like um, when you have a drink, right? You can drink your whiskey neat, that means without any water, or you can you know, have some water with it. Okay. Right, so um, the, um, the film um, goes through a, a lot of very interesting you know, uh, processes as you, as you do the rolling. Um, in fact, there is a, a, a phase inversion. Hmm? At, this, when in, at the entry hmm, of the film, um, will 
what, what you'll see is that you have an um, oil in water suspension. Yes. As you go into the very high pressure situation, yes, it reverses. You get a suspension of water in oil. Yes. And eventually, um, in the roll gap, it's pretty much oil. Yes. Pretty much. So it's like uh, the very high pressures squeeze out the water phase in, uh, from the lubricant. Hmm? Uh, but e even that can, um, you know, if, if we have very high rolling speeds, um, the film does not eternally uh, uh, grow in thickness. You can have, um, the, because the, the oil has to flow into the, 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 the roll gap, if you, your rolling speed is too high, the uh, amount of oil um, entrapped is uh, uh, too small and you get what's called oil starvation and then the, the, the friction, the film thickness collapses yes, and the, the friction of course goes off. Hmm? Um, now, so, so you need to have a, a, a stable film here, a stable film and that's why um, these surfactants and all these other chemical products, phosphorus containing products, sulfur containing products, all this advanced chemistry is so important in, um, in these uh, lubricants because they, it's, they're all about stabilizing the, um, the, the film. Hmm? So the, when you're looking into this uh, emulsion uh, layer in the uh, lubricant layer in the roll gap, and this is, would be your, your surface, and then on the other side is the roll, there is actually a lot of interesting chemistry happening at the interfaces. You have about, say, a few hundred nanometers of, uh, of film thickness, and then, at, but at the very surface you will have these sulfur compounds, these phosphorus compounds, that will stabilize your um, your lubricant layer hmm? because you you don't want to have boundary lubrication conditions hmm? because then you have extremely high uh, uh, frictions hmm? um, and you want to have a boundary film that's nicely adhering to the surface hmm? so close to the steel uh, you have these sulfur compounds and phosphate compounds which are inorganic compounds and then as you move towards the inside of the lubricant layer you got more organic matter. Hmm? Um, so you don't want uh, boundary lubrication condition. When, when would you get them? When the velocities are low. Yeah? So when you start, when you start rolling, yes? When you, you know, when you start rolling, when you change uh, uh, um, you, you, um, you're in between two coils, for instance, yes, and you, you have to start the rolling, that, that part is very critical because you have very low, you have very low friction, a uh, very, excuse me, very low um, thickness of the um, boundary layer, so you have high friction, yes? So in low speed condition, you will have boundary uh, uh, Lubrication, of course, at high temperature, and, and if you have high roughness, that's uh, mm. um, so you want to have a boundary film that adheres nicely to the metal surfaces, mm. and it should have uh, uh, it, it should be easy to shear it, yeah, so it doesn't uh, contribute much to the um, to friction, and it should have a high resistance to being squeezed out of the roll gap. Mm. So that's, uh, what you want of the uh, rolling mill. So um, let's uh, turn now our attention from this uh, important uh, lubrication uh, element. Uh, the, uh, what happens to the material when we do the rolling? Well, we start with material that comes from the hot rolling mill. Uh, if it's a low carbon steel, um, it will be fully recrystallized, like this. And uh, you pass it through the cold rolling mill, and what comes out is a heavily 
cold rolled microstructure hmm, with very high dislocation density. Hmm. Uh, pronounced crystallographic texture. So in the process, what happens is that you have a material with no preferred orientation that has a very strong uh, orientation, crystallographic orientation uh, preference. Yes? And in fact, what we see is um, uh, we develop in uh, the combination of cold rolling and uh, annealing, yeah? we develop this gamma fiber. This gamma fiber is uh, characterized with by a 111 direction perpendicular to the normal direction, normal direction of the, the strip, the strip surface. Hmm? Yes. Now, again, um, we cannot use the uh, cold rolled material as such. It's much too hard. Yes. It would um, uh, give you no plasticity, no deformation possibilities. So we need to anneal it, and uh, this is an annealing process. You can see that, again, driven by the, uh, the dislocation density, you get a crystallization process. You see that uh, grains are uh, being replaced by, um, very heavily pancake grains are being replaced by equiaxed grains. Hmm? And we develop during that process a, this crystallographic texture. One, 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 parallel to normal direction. That is for specifically for carbon steels. So, so that for a large group of, of products, that gives me a high R value hmm, and a low planar anisotropy, meaning that uh, their formability is good and the anisotropy of the formability properties is small. Hmm. We'll explain again what uh, we mean by this in a um, um, future uh, lecture. We, at this case stage, I, I really want to focus on technology issues. Um, so what the annealing itself is carried out by two methods. We have batch annealing or you have continuous annealing. And you can already see on this image what the big difference is in the batch annealing we just have a coil, a massive coil that is annealed, yes, as such. In the continuous annealing, we have a strip. We unwind the coil, yes, and we, uh, we gradually process it. We unwind it and we pass it through a furnace and, um, uh, and, and we can continuously operate this furnace by feeding it with strip, yes, uh, in a continuous fashion. Here we have to charge and uncharge the batch annealing furnace. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, let's first look at this batch annealing furnace. So what you see here is the interior of the furnace, the, the um, uh, uh, and, and this is the cover of the furnace. This actually contains the burners, Etc. Mm. So, you, in a typical batch annealing furnace, you have many, many of these batch annealing furnaces. You see, you have one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. You have many, many. Yes. Mm. Um, the batch weight can be of the order of 100 tons. So, as you know, uh, so a, a coil can weigh about, say, um, you know, 20 tons, a little bit less. So that means you, you're always uh, annealing four, five, that order of, um, that number of coils at, at the same time in such a um, batch annealing furnace, yes? Um, see, for instance, here you have uh, annealing hoods, so that means these kind of furnaces here in a typical plant would be about 50. The bases, which these are the bases here, there are about 80. Why is that such a big difference between the number of hoods and the number of bases? Because you need to cool down, right? So when, when this guy is cooling down, um, there's no need for a furnace cover, right? So you, this one is cooling down, you can use the cover on the other one. So 
about half the bases are in cooling mode and half the bases are in heating mode. And that's the reason why there is this big difference. Yeah? Um, right, and um, important is the, the surface cleanliness. You'll see uh, what we mean with this, but it's typically of the order of um, five or six milligrams carbon per square meter. This carbon comes from the lubricant that we use, yes? And, the, um, and we, uh, we can use uh, inside this furnace hydrogen or um, hydrogen-nitrogen mixtures. The heating, always preferred, is the uh, natural gas heating because it's not as expensive as electrically heating, but the, you, you can also uh, see uh, batch annealing furnaces that are electrically heated. So this is the picture. What, what you are seeing this here, this, this reddish uh, structure here, that's, that's this one here. That's the exterior of this, the furnace. Yes? So inside here, you, ha you have stacked the coils. You introduce a mixture of hydrogen nitrogen through this, um, uh, in this um, container, as it were. And on the outside, you have the actual furnace. So this, oops, uh, this is actually this thing here. Yes? So that, that structure contains the burners. Yes? And so you heat up without touching the, the uh, without heating directly the, the coils. Hmm? Obviously you can imagine if you have here, like here, about 60 tons, 50 or 60 tons of steel tightly coiled it will take you a long time to um, uh, recrystallize. And indeed, um, this is the ter thermal cycle. And if we look, uh, so this is the, the cycle that is followed. But you look at the coiled strip, that's the uh, dashed line here. You see that to reach the recrystallization temperature yes, of 650, hmm, you need uh, well, close to 25, 25 to 30 hours. So it, it takes a whole day to get there, okay? And, of course, uh, if it takes you so long to heat it up, it takes you also a long time to cool it down. Hmm? And so uh, if you, so you, you cool down, yes, you see that the rate of cooling is, is, is different. That's when you remove the, yes. Anyway, and the end of the cycle is about 120 degrees. You, you can see that it takes normal system about 70 hours. Yes, so the, more than two days. Yes, more than two days. Um, yes. So when we, um, uh, at the end of this um, process, hmm, we, we have strip with the nice crystallography uh, properties. Yeah, this 111 parallel to normal direction. Um, and this gives me a high R value. The R value is, is the following. If I strain the material in this length direction, yes, um, I have a thickness strain and a width strain. If I want to avoid fracture, yes, I, I want to, the thickness strain to be minimal. Hmm? So, and the width strain can be large. So the R value is basically the ratio of width strain to thickness strain. So remember, I want the thickness strain to be small, so I want to have a high R value. Hmm? So the thickness strain I want small, the width strain can be, can be higher, so I want R to be high. Hmm? And I also want this property, yes, n not to be sensitive to the direction in which I test. Yes? Hmm? So if this is this is the sheet surface, yes? I can test in this direction, but I can also test in this direction or in in between direction, yes? I don't want this R value that I measure to differ too much, yes? And so a measure for this change in R is this delta R parameter, which we call planar anisotropy, yes? Planar and as you want it as small as possible. Hmm? All right. And so the 
the case where you get this best situation is, is shown here, right? So if this is, you have to imagine that uh, the, um, this um, fiber texture, this would be your unit cell, yes? And in, if you have a 111 or, uh, fiber texture, it means that the 111 direction in a typical grain, so this is a typical grain, Yes, if I looked at the unit cell, this uh, 111 uh, direction would be uh, perpendicular to the strip surface. The, the other directions can still be anything, right? It can still be rotated. So um, that's why we call it a fiber texture. Only the one direction is specified, is, 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 um, is uh, parallel to the normal direction, yes? Uh, in this case, for instance, I have shown one specific um, texture component, which has the 111 direction perpendicular to the normal direction and the 110 direction perpendicular to the rolling direction. This is also a good texture component. So this means that if we have a gamma fiber, many grains have this orientation. And when many grains have this orientation, I have good uh, formability. Hmm? Um, it turns out that for many carb low carbon products, the if you measure the R value as a function of the angle to the rolling direction, so this angle here, yes, you see that the R value is not constant. Yes, it has a certain value at zero degrees a minimum value at 45, and then a high value at 90 degrees, yes? And so to take this into account, we introduce a factor Rm, which gives me the mean value of, these, uh, of this variation. Hmm? So you take one times the measurement at this position, two times here, and one times here, Yes, and you divide by four. That's, that's in technical terms, that's what we call the mean uh, uh, normal anisotropy. If you look at the uh, variation in the plane, the planar anisotropy, we, we do the difference between these guys and the difference between these guys. So this, this difference and this difference. Yes, hmm, this, uh, that's uh, this term here and this term here. Hmm. We do this different, and we divide by two, right? <coughs> and that gives me an idea of the planar anisotropy, all right? You can readily see if a material has um, uh, anisotropy or not. If you uh, make a little cup, deep draw a cup from a material with this kind of anisotropy, you get these um, this cyanozoidal thickness um, uh, um, ears formed at the cup edge, and this earring is a, a, a telltale sign of um, planar anisotropy. Okay, we'll um, come to the end of the course uh, lecture today. Excuse me, and um, so we'll continue on um, uh, Wednesday. Thank you very much.